please remain standing if you're able to for the reading of God's Word. Church Online would also join us this morning. Today, we're going to begin by looking at Matthew chapter 10, verses 16 to 20. Jesus himself is speaking to his disciples and he says, Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Be aware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues. And you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake, to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. When they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Let's pray together this morning. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for this moment where I know that your presence is here with us. Lord, I thank you that your spirit is mighty, your power is present, and that you are worthy of our exaltation. You are worthy to be lifted high. And God, we stand here this morning to exalt your name on high, to give you praise because we are not merely your creation. We are not merely individuals who have gathered. We are the children of the living, mighty, wonderful God who has called us to Himself to serve Him, to live for Him, but to sing songs of praise to the precious Savior of all humanity. So we exalt Your name on high, and we are gathered here so that Your Word, Your truth would penetrate the depths of our hearts. So if there is any iniquity, if there is any wretchedness, if there is anything that does not belong in there, that your might, your power, your spirit would remove it. So Jesus, speak to every heart in this place today. Speak to every heart who hears this message. Because this time, this hour, is the hour that our Savior speaks. We exalt your name. In the name of my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, everybody. How's everyone doing this morning? <clears throat> Good. I think this side is a bit more better than the other side. But hey, who am I to judge here this morning, huh? You know, before we get it started, I have to tell you, whatever it is that God wants to speak to you today, Satan didn't want it to happen. The enemy didn't want you to hear this message, and I have to come to the conclusion that it is important. It is important that God didn't want it to happen. But I'm thankful, though. I'm thankful because I'm thankful that God doesn't need a man like me to speak his hope and salvation and grace to you guys. That even if I weren't here, God would still find a stick to speak. He would find a block to speak. He would find an instrument or he would find a more, more handsome man than I to speak to you the message of the gospel. But the truth is, he doesn't need me, but he will still speak. His word will still speak to you today, and I hope that you allow his word to speak to you as we just read through it and as we allow his spirit to move in this place. I've titled this message, Let's Live Twice. And the reason is because as we get into chapter 10 of Matthew, if you want to open your Bibles and be ready for it, as we look at chapter 10 of Matthew, Jesus calls his disciples, and Jesus shows his disciples and the disciples are going to learn through this passage that they get to live once on this earth for Jesus that everything else doesn't really matter but they also learn you will see later on in the gospel of Matthew and even within this chapter they will learn that even if they do die in this world they will still live a second time for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ because of the hope of Jesus Christ and I want to let you know this because it's important that we if you call yourself a disciple if you call yourself a follower of Jesus you live twice 
you live the first life in the fullest extent. And when I say fullest extent, some of you think of, of the crazy things that everybody else does. No, fullest extent means that you live a good life that honors God and you're not getting in trouble for everything else that everybody else gets in trouble for. But you, if you die, when you die, you will still get to live a second time. And that is victorious by itself. Now, what is, what is amazing, though, is... If you open to Matthew chapter 10, verse 1, it starts like this. Last week, we talked about, last week, we talked about the authority of Jesus, how he has authority in Matthew chapter 8 and 9 over governmental powers, over spiritual powers, demonic powers, over financial powers. It doesn't matter what power or authority there is. Jesus has authority over it. And this is in verse 1, chapter 10. It says, and he called to him, Jesus called to him his 12 disciples and gave them, what is the word right there? What, what is the word right there? Jesus gave them authority over the unclean spirits to cast out and to heal every disease and every affliction. So here's a, here's a God who has authority over everything. And he comes and calls his disciples to himself and says, I'm giving you authority. The authority of God is given to his disciples. Now that's crazy. That's crazy. Because if you're a disciple of Jesus, technically you receive the authority of Jesus. But then he says, hey, here's where it gets interesting. The next verse, and some of you are saying, is he really going to read the names? Yes. Okay, it says the next verse says, verse 2 says, the names of the 12 apostles. Interesting detail right here. First, let me pause right here. Apostles, the first time in the scripture in Matthew where the disciples are referred to as apostles, the word literally translates to the sent out ones. Okay, the people are sent out. The name of the 12 apostles are these. First Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew, who is the author of this gospel, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot. Now, here's, here's where things get really interesting. And Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Now, Jesus is giving authority but yet he's also given authority to Judas, who's going to betray him, who is the betrayer. Now, some of you may say, well, at this point, he hadn't betrayed Jesus yet. But the scripture is clear that Jesus knew from the beginning that Judas was going to betray him. But yet still Jesus gives authority to Judas to, to do the same things, miracles that the other apostles are about to do. Now, why, why is that so significant? Is because we're living in a time where, if you have noticed, many spiritual leaders are falling from the truth. Many spiritual pastors and leaders and, 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 and these well-known people that you believed in in the scriptural concept, they're falling away from the truth of God. And the thing about it is they still had authority at some point. And God doesn't need me or you or, or any human being to preach the gospel of salvation. God can use a stick if he wanted to. God can use anything he wants to do this. But he often sometimes gives authority to even the betrayers. Because where Judas thought... He's going to betray Jesus and have Jesus be crucified. Jesus be crucified. Jesus was resurrected because of his sinfulness. Because of Judas' sinfulness. Now, to illustrate this, go, before we go further, I want to I show you something. Is Brevin here? I'm going to ask Brevin to join me for a second. Would you guys give him a round of applause? I want to show you something. See, most of you didn't have a clue. This is Brevin, by the way. Come on, come on, buddy. This is my awesome friend, Brevin. Most of you had no clue that I have artistic abilities. Not autistic, art, artistic abilities. <laughs> what I'm going to do in the next 30 seconds, if you're patient with me, I'm going to draw a portrait of this, of this handsome man. Okay? You guys didn't know I could do that, did you? I'm going to, uh, uh, this is going to be great. Okay, you guys ready for this? That's perfect, perfect pose. Let me, uh, give me 30 seconds, okay? I'm going to draw. Got to make sure I get all the details right in 30 seconds, a short time to do this perfectly. Get the lip details right there. Hold on. Almost done. Almost done. I know he's... Uh, wow, this looks just like you. <laughs> all right. I think... Was that 30 seconds? <laughs> oh, oh yeah well it's, I, I, I'm just in a, it's really uh, it's okay don't worry it, not all details I don't have that much time but, but I know you guys want to see this doesn't Brevin look awesome 
could you turn around for a second? You have a 3D view of Brevin. The way God made him, amazing in creation. You guys want to see my art? Doesn't this just look just... <laughs> looks just like him. Uh, don't I have artistic abilities? <laughs> Thanks, buddy. <laughs> Some of you are clapping. I'm going to talk to you about false encouragement, guys, in a little bit. <laughs> but the thing about this, and the reason I want to do this for you, is because we look at Brevin, a beautiful creation of God, okay? But oftentimes our perception of the truth of God is just like this. We have something beautiful ahead of us, something amazing, glorious, and the only thing we see is a stick figure. We look at a Judas, a betrayer, where God is using for the sake of resurrection. We look at our lives and say it's a chaos and mess, and God is like, no, 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 you're looking at it like this. I am doing something amazing. I'm doing something amazing in it. So I'm going to refer to this constantly and through the message because my art is going to be a reminder, not only that I'm not called to be an artist, but that God is doing something great in your lives. Don't look at it in that sense. There are five things. See, a lot of times people come to me and, and look at a particular aspect of the Scripture and say, you know what, this, this portion of the Scripture doesn't really talk to me. It doesn't do what I need it to do. It doesn't speak to my heart. It, it's a historical thing. It's, a, it's an informative thing. But I believe, and if you're one of those guys, I... I, 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 I speak against what you say in that sense because I believe that it doesn't matter what aspect of the scripture you're looking at God still speaks through it to your life because God's word was written to penetrate the hearts of people to bring transformation and change to your life so it doesn't matter what you're looking at or how you're looking at it God will still speak to you through his word and the passage we are about to read the portion of the scripture we are about to read some of us may just look at it as Jesus sending his disciples out I look at it as God is speaking to us today how we ought to be his apostles so there are five things that i want you to see if you want to write them down i want to give them to you right off the bat it's up to you if you see the five things i see tell you in this if you see it for yourself or not okay five things that i want you to see and they're simple the first one is this if you want to write them down take a picture of the screen whatever is easiest for you okay the first one is this when jesus sends his people out he sends them out with a specific location in mind when Jesus sends his people out, he sends them out with a specific location in mind. And people always come to me and say, well, I, I wasn't sent by God to a specific location. Now listen, don't look at it like this. Look at it the way God has designed it. That's the first task for you, okay? A specific location in mind. For, for some of you, maybe it's your job environment. For some of you, it's maybe your school. For some of you, it's a different country. For my wife and I, for Nicole and I, it's Catalina. Yeah, Persian dude. God has brought a Persian guy to Catalina with a specific location in mind. Okay? The second thing I want you to see in this particular passage is when God, Jesus sends his people out, he sends them out to a specific target audience. God is a God of order and plans. When God sends you out, he sends you out to a specific target audience. Jesus is not going to send everybody. He's not going to send everybody to speak to the Muslims. He's not going to send everybody to speak to, to the doctors. Everybody is called to a different target audience based on your creation, based on the way God has designed you perfectly. The problem with our culture is that we confuse equality with similarity. They're two different things. We were created equally, but not similarly. Each one of us bring a different perspective to the kingdom of God. Each one of us serve Jesus in a different way. The third thing I want you to see is when Jesus sends his people out, he sends them out with a specific task at hand. Everybody has a different task, okay? And the problem with us is we don't like the task. Because we don't like the task, our biggest excuse is often this, God didn't tell me what I'm supposed to do, so I'm not doing it. Jesus calls you to a specific location, to a specific target audience with a specific task in mind. And here's the thing. The fourth thing that comes is really the horrible, the, the horrible one that we really don't like. When Jesus sends his people out, he sends them out with a specific warning ahead. There's always a warning that comes when Jesus sends his people out. Like you see in the passage, I'm sending you as sheep among the wolves. That doesn't sound fun. I don't want to be torn apart. 
And the problem is we look at these four things and sometimes we just want to stick to the fifth one and say, you know what, the fifth one I like, I'm going to tell you what it is, but the rest of them I don't really like so much. The fifth one is this, when Jesus sends his people out, he sends them out with a specific promise to come. So, well, oh, can I hold on just to the promise and the rest of them will de deal with themselves? No, you can't. You have to have the location, you have to have the task, you have to know the audience, you have to be able to go through what he has warned you about so that you could experience the promise. Everybody so good so far with me? You guys with me still? This side is with me. I'll talk to you guys. Because <laughs> Thank you for listening. <laughs> but it says in verse 5, it says in verse 5, these 12 Jesus sent out. The word sent out is the same word as apostle. He made them into apostles. These 12, Jesus sent out instructing them, go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The first thing you see is they're sent to a specific location, to a specific target audience. Okay, why, why is that so significant? Because Jesus is sending him, only, sending him out only to the Jews. And some of you may, may read this and say, well, hold on a second, I thought Jesus loves everybody. Why is he only sending him out to the Jews? There are a couple reasons behind that. To begin, they're just starting to be apostles. The disciples are just starting to be apostles. Now, here's the thing. Some of you might say, you know what, Nasser, all those five things you mentioned, they don't apply to me. If that's what you say, here's what I would ask you. Are you a disciple of Jesus? Do you believe you follow Jesus? If you do follow him, then all of them apply to you. He's going to send you out to a specific location, a specific target audience, a specific task at hand, specific warnings coming with a specific promise to come. But if you're not a follower, then, then this is not for you. So Jesus tells you, here's your specific audience for you and target that I'm sending you. Here's where you're going, your location. And some of you may say, hold on, hold on, hold on. I thought Jesus loves everybody. Why are they only sent to the Jews? Two reasons. The first one, two th multiple theological reasons, but the first one is because, scripturally speaking, the Bible says that the Jews had to reject the truth so that the truth could be given to those other than the Jews. The second reason is very interesting is, and this is going to mess some of you up, okay? Jesus is sending him out to be rejected. We don't like that word. We live in a culture that rejection is not something we like. But Jesus is sending the disciples to experience rejected because the disciples are going out with this understanding of God's word. Where God has a more beautiful picture in mind for them. He's sending him out among the wolves so that they would reject the disciples, so that they would know that when the people reject you, God will never forsake you. So Jesus is sending him out among the wolves, and it's very interesting. I'm going to skip a few verses right here. It's very interesting. If you look at verse 11, um, it says, And whatever town or village you, you enter, find out who is worthy in, in that and stay there until you depart. And verse 12 says, As you enter the house, greet it. And if the house is worthy, if the house is worthy, in other words, you need to have a sense of rejection, okay? Let your peace come upon it, but if, if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. Now, this is really interesting. Because Jesus says, hold, hold on, Here, here's a task that I have for you. I'm going to jump back to verse 8 for a second. He says, I'm sending you to a specific target audience. I'm sending you to a specific location. And verse 8 is, your task is this. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You receive without paying, give without paying. And then you ask yourself, hold on a second. If I'm doing all these amazing things as disciples, and I'm going to somebody's house and they reject me, why would they reject me when I'm doing miracles? Why would they reject me when they hear God is going to do great things? Why would people reject the truth? Why would people do reject the amazing things that God is doing? Why in the world would anybody do that? Here's why. Because when you step on the devil's territory, he's going to do everything he can to cast you out and, and make sure that you don't claim that territory for yourself. Make sure that you don't claim that territory for the sake of the gospel. Why would they reject you? For the same reason they rejected Jesus. He did miracles. He did wonders. But you know what? They put him on the cross. He said, well, but hold on a second, hold on a second. I thought I had authority. 
It says, it says in verse 1, Jesus gave them authority. They're going to reject? How dare? How dare they're going to reject what? <laughs> Stick figure. It's our perception. We only look, we look at authority like this. We look at wisdom like this. We look at the scripture like this. Everything we do in our lives established on our simplistic perception. And God has created something beautiful. So it gets really amazing. It says, it says in the next verse, verse 16, I'm going to skip a couple verses here. Verse 16 says, Behold, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Be aware of men, for they would deliver you over to the courts and flog you in their synagogues, and you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. <laughs> Look at the next verse. It says, When they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. It's crazy. You read this, oh, hold on, hold on, Jesus. I thought, I, I thought you said authority. I like that. I like authority. Can I keep it? I thought you said I have authority, and because I have authority, I, I, nothing bad can happen to me. <laughs> Stick figure. Yes, you have authority. But the problem, you see, the problem in our culture is we live in a culture that does not like rejection. Okay? We live in a culture that thinks rejection doesn't exist. Let me put it this way. We confuse it. So let me give you this analogy. Okay? We live in a culture where everybody's a winner. Okay? You send your kids to school, and maybe, maybe your son wants to play baseball, and he can't hit the ball for, the, for his life. But you know what they tell you? Encourage him. Build him up. Make sure you constantly tell them you are going to be a professional baseball player. The kid can't hit the ball. Why would you lie to his face? See, or we, we say encourage people. You know, I want to be a singer, but I can't sing to a tune. I, I don't have any musical ability in me. I can't sing. Encourage, encourage. He will be a professional singer one day. Why not tell him, hey, don't quit your day job. That's not what God has made you for. I want to be an artist. <laughs> Just because I want something, it doesn't mean that I should get it. That's what I'm telling you. Just because I want something, it doesn't mean that I was made for that. So we confuse encouragement with what God really means for it. Encouragement is to build somebody up to be the person God wants them to be, not the person you want or he wants or she wants to be. To encourage somebody it means to bring somebody to the recognition that they're going to have to be rejected of all the things they like and they think is important so that they could become the person that God has created them to be so they would understand that God accepts them the way He has made them to be. And I tell you this because maybe it's not a scriptural right now for some of you, but you are being rejected right now in your lives. Some of you are going through tremendous things. Some of you are going through maybe rejection of family members, your children, your parents, your job. Whatever it is, don't look at it like this. Because every time you're rejected, God can use that to show you He will never forsake you. He will never leave you. He will never reject you. <laughs> you have authority. Oh, let's go back to that authority for a second. Okay, I have authority. You will receive authority. You will have powers over the demons and all that. But, but hold on a second. If I have authority, then why am I being dragged to the courts and the synagogues? Why am I being beaten? Why are people rejecting everything? If I have authority, shouldn't I, shouldn't I be able to say, you know what? Excuse me, I have the authority of God. You can't arrest me. Uh, no. You have authority to speak the name of Jesus. You're going to be taken to the courtrooms. Look at, look at verse, verse um, 19. I'm, I'm jumping all over the place. I hope you have your Bibles, but verse 19 says, When they uh, deliver you over, do not be anxious how you are to speak. Okay. Now look back to the verse before that. Verse 18 says, the second part of verse 18 says, You'll be dragged to the courtrooms, but it says, To bear witness before them and the Gentiles. In other words, your authority is to speak the name of Jesus. 
Whether you are dragged into the courtroom or you're not dragged into the courtroom, whether you are beaten and bruised, everywhere you go, your authority is to show the name of Jesus to everybody. That's your authority. And then he says, don't worry about what you say because God will speak. He's, God is speaking. But look at, look at verse 21. It says, brother will deliver brother over to death and the father, his child, and children will raise against parents and have them put to death. That sounds exciting. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. Here's your warning. Here's your warning. You want to go be a disciple? That's good. You want to be a disciple? That's great. But are you ready to go to a location? Are you ready to go to the audience? Are you ready to go to this, with a specific test? Now, do you see the warning? You know, my wife and I, when we lived overseas in a Muslim country, we... Guys, I, I, we have seen things that would blow your mind away. I saw a father. I could never comprehend parents could do that. I saw a father hire a mob to beat his son and daughter-in-law who was pregnant half to death because they had gone to church. I saw a father beat his son, 16-year-old boy, so badly and kick him out of the house forever, casting him out from his house because he had gone to church and called on the name of Jesus. Father will hate his children. Brothers will hate one another. Why? Because you have the authority of Jesus. Some of you here say, I don't want that authority. I don't want that authority because I don't want to be hated. I don't want to be rejected. I don't like that. So we skip all of it. So we can have the promise. Oh, I'll have eternal life, though. It's great. Look at this. The second part of verse 22 says, But the one who endures to the end. The one who does what? I'm, I'm sorry, what am I supposed to do now? <laughs> the one who endures to the end will be saved? Are you saying that I have to be the sheep among those wolves so they can rip me apart? Are you saying that I have to be dragged into the courtroom? Are you saying that I have to be beaten up? Are you saying that I have to go through all these crazy things and be rejected and hated by the people around me so that I, I would be saved? Here's my, I want to finish with this question for you guys, and this is so important. Do you know the location that God has sent you? Do you know the audience He has sent you? Do you know the task He has for you? Do you know the warnings He has for you? Because without those, the promise is useless. Let me, let me put it this way. If you go to work, if you hang out with your family members, and they don't believe in Jesus, they don't believe that He is the Son of the living God sent to earth to save humanity from their sins. It doesn't matter what they believe. If they don't believe in what you believe as a disciple of Jesus, and yet they welcome you, and they love you because they see no difference in your life, because you do everything they do, they enjoy, you enjoy everything they enjoy, you speak the same things they speak, you drink the same things they drink, and you're not hated because your life does not expose the darkness, is it possible that you're not even a disciple? Is it possible that you don't understand that you have held on to the promise but bypassed everything else? Is it possible to look and see where God has called you really? Or are you missing that point? See, are you looking at the Word of God and drawing a stick figure out of it because that's sufficient for you? Because here's the thing. If you are a follower of Jesus, when you go somewhere, when you hang out with your friends, they will not invite you sometimes the next time because you will expose the darkness that exists because you will show that that's not the way that God has called you to live the first time in this world. 
see the problem with Christianity today the modern Christianity is that we don't know what it means to be apostles we don't know what it means to be sent out we are sent out to cleanse the world but as we do we will step on the wrong territory and we will be rejected abused and hurt see you come to this church this is the only place you should be accepted but when you go out people are going to have to hate you and I know that's not the warning you like I know that's not the warning you're looking for but whoever endures to the end will be saved not easy but listen to me what if you don't realize that you are the last hope you are the last hope this community may have to ever see the path of righteousness what if you are the same as everybody else if you look the same the same, speak the same, drink the same, eat the same, smoke the same. Where is the authority of Jesus? You are the last hope in a nation that is crumbling, in a society that is breaking. The last hope for a world that is broken to hear that there is a hope of salvation and redemption and his name is Jesus what are you doing with that hope what are you doing with it is the warning too hard for you is being a disciple too difficult for you so what's for Jesus cost him a brutal death on the cross so let me finish this morning by reading Psalm 142 David before he was King David before the promise when he was fleeing and he was hiding in a cave when he was rejected he said these words would you mind standing up for this if you're able to church online you too Verse 1 says, with my voice, I cry out to the Lord. With my voice, I plead for mercy to the Lord. I pour out my complaint before Him. I tell my trouble before Him. When my spirit faints within me, you know my way. In the path where I walk, they have hidden a trap for me. Look to the right and see, there is none who takes notice of me. No refuge remains to me. No one cares for my soul. I am rejected. Look at this. I cry to you, O Lord. I say, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Because it doesn't matter how you are rejected, you will never be forsaken. You will never be left alone by your Savior. So listen, if the Spirit of God leads you this morning to come and kneel before His presence, come kneel up here in your seats. If the Spirit of God leads you, just bow your heads or raise your hands to exalt the name of our Savior. Father, I give you praise in this place. Father, I give you praise because I, can, I have to only look at my own life. If the Islamic Republic of Iran did not reject me and my family, I would never be a follower of Christ. I would never be a pastor. Father, if I had not experienced rejection, I would never know that my God loves me and died on the cross for my sins. Father, I thank you that you help each and every person in this room to know that this world will hate them and reject them because they don't understand what the hope of Christ looks like. 
because they don't understand or they do not want to accept that our God is the God above all the authority above all authorities the name above every name and he lives in the heart of his disciples father I pray for every soul here and those watching online that today the words they have read and heard would stick in their hearts that they would know that they are not forsaken by you they are loved by you but yet they will be forsaken in this world because the path of this world is the path of darkness is a path of evil and those who love you cannot exist in it but God I thank you that we get to live twice I thank you that this world is the closest thing to hell we will ever know and as we honor you in this world we honor you knowing that the second time we live it will be a life of glory a life of experiencing the king of kings face to face in a place where there is no sorrow there is no pain there is no rejection father i thank you that you open our minds and our hearts to know that when we look at things as just a stick figure you have created a beautiful plan for our lives you have called us to specific tasks and locations and mindset with the promise but you have been warned us to stay faithful to you God fill us with the spirit of encouragement in its true form not to be deceptive people who, who drag people to, to, to do whatever they want to do, but to encourage people to be built up for the purpose of which you have created them to be. Jesus, I pray for every soul in this room, for all those watching online, that today they would call on your name, the name above all names, the authority above all authorities, and to know that because of your authority, they can speak the name of Jesus wherever they are without shame without guilt but with honor and father I pray when the hard times come for us this week that you would give us strength to endure to stand firm to believe that our Savior is with us every step of the way Father, I thank you for every soul here. I thank you for all those watching online. I thank you that you speak. I thank you that you speak. Your word is sufficient. Bless us, Father. In your holy and precious name, I pray.